The time was 1935. The place, Tupelo, Mississippi. God sent this world a baby boy who was born in poverty. And as a boy, he wondered what would be his destiny. His life was to be busy and things would happen that even he couldn't believe. He had so much to give, yet very little to receive. He started with a song and a wiggle and some people couldn't understand. But you and I now know that it was all in God's plan. No sooner had he started than he was to lose his most precious prize. Tragedy struck this young man's life. His mother died. By this time he had the colonel who was to guide his every step. And things began to happen that neither one could seem to help. He came home from the army and we saw him on TV. And because of that wiggle, they wouldn't even show his knees. His career grew and he started making movies. And this took him from us for a while. Even though he didn't like it, he still gave the world a smile. Then he came back to us in person because to sing for his fans was what he really enjoyed. And when he felt that he didn't please us with himself, he was annoyed. We demanded, not understanding, that he give to us his all. He tried to do what we wanted for the big and the small. The demand for his records or to have a glimpse or touch his hand. Bit by bit, this took its toll, for even he was just a man. Oh yeah, he was very happy living, and he wasn't afraid to die. Even now, though our hearts are broken, he wouldn't want us to cry. God in all of his wisdom, even though we loved him so, he knew what was best. We don't understand it, but it was time for him to go. Let you and I and our memory never lose what he gave, because while he was living, forgotten country, you and I, he was a slave. Yes, heaven now is brighter, though this world has lost the light. Take care of business. That's what he'd tell us. You must carry on the fight. Even his daddy and little Lisa, they must accept what God has done. Even though, like our Heavenly Father, Vernon gave his only son. Now the show is over and the curtain has come down. Elvis has left the building, but will always be around. Precious memories Flood my soul Elvis lived uh, two blocks from the Ellis Auditorium in Memphis, Tennessee. Was a young boy of 14 years old and he used to come to the uh, gospel sings that the Blackwood brothers had at Dallas Auditorium in Memphis. 
And at that time, uh, he was 14 years old and uh, was not in the business, just coming to hear us sing. He was standing around backstage and uh, hang around with me, ask questions, and uh, that's the way I first met Elvis Presley. Of course, at that time, I didn't even know his name. Just a little boy hanging around backstage uh, was more or less, to an extent, a nuisance, uh, asking questions, uh, which wasn't important to me, but I guess they was to him. But that's my first recollection of knowing the Elvis Presley. Elvis grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, and uh, at that time, uh, the Melody Boys were on in uh, Little Rock. He could uh, pick up that station, uh, Joe Roper and the Melody Boys. Then the Blackwood Brothers were on in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, every quartet that he could uh, tune in, well, he listened to because that was his favorite kind of music. Well, it's all he listened to. Uh, I couldn't say that it was his, his favorite, but his, his, well, I would have to, I guess, because it's what he left to listen to. Elvis never listened to nothing but uh, gospel music. Even in his uh, music room or television room now at Graceland, uh, you can go by and look at the records, the albums that are on display there, and uh, you will see nothing but gospel quartets, including the Blackwood Brothers, the Stamps, the Statesmen, uh, Florida Boys, the Imperial Spear family, he had them all. Well, Mr. Sum, uh, how, did, how did your group, uh, the Stamps and yourself, begin working with Elvis? Well, years ago I had uh, Sumar Talent Agency. In that agency, I had the Imperials and I was, it was sort of a management booking agency. And the Imperials were working with Elvis. And uh, they also started booking with Jimmy Dean. And uh, they had a double booking. They come up and had a, some dates booked with Jimmy Dean, and Elvis decided he wanted to make a tour. Uh, when Elvis decided he wanted to go, well, he wanted to go and uh, came up that the Imperials were under contract to Jimmy Dean and could not make this tour. So Elvis called me and uh, wanted me to get him a quartet that was good enough to go with him on this tour to replace the Imperials. At that time, I had Richard Sturbin, uh, who is now with the Oak Ridge Boys, singing bass. I had Bill Bays. I had the quartet that I thought that... Uh, was good enough to back up Elvis Preston. So I told him, I said, it just so happens that the Stamps can go with you on this tour. I'll send you a record of them. We had just a brand new record just released. I sent him a record and uh, my idea was uh, to put the Stamps on there and me, at that time, I was trying to retire. Is the reason I hired Richard Sturbin. So I I thought if I could get the Stamps Quartet a gig that I wouldn't have to sing on, then I could go and play golf and stay with my wife. But uh, it didn't work out that way. When I, we got to Milwaukee, our first date, to start the tour, to start rehearsing, I went along just to see that the Stamps Quartet done their job and done it right to get everything uh, under control. And, but Elvis uh, told me, and in fact, in the rehearsal room, I was sitting out in a chair, and everybody else was up on the little stage that they had built to rehearse, and Elvis said, get up here, J.D., I want you to sing bass. I said, you don't need me, I got a bass singer. He said, no, I want you, I want some of those 56 endings, uh, like what he meant by that was the way I always slur down on the end of a song. Ooh, yeah. uh, that's what he wanted. And uh, so I, ha I found myself backing up Elvis Presley when it wasn't my intentions. There are many questions that people like to uh, have answered. 
about Elvis and what I do is take uh, the ones that I can and try to answer them. Um, I feel like I have a right. I feel like that uh, I am in no defense of Elvis in answering these questions. Uh, I'm just simply telling the truth about a bunch of lies that's been written. And the number one question that people like to ask, they want to know, first off, uh, was Elvis on dope? There's a God above. He's there right now. And my trust is in God. And God strike me dead right here on this stage if I lie to you. I have no reason to. But Elvis Presley was not on dope. He was not an idiot. There's, there's different, when you speak of dope, when you speak of dope, uh, you, if you take two aspirin, you're taking dope. But Elvis Presley was not on dope. I spent too much time with him, just he and I. I won't say that I knew him as good as anybody in the world, but I knew Elvis Presley as good as I know anybody. I was never in his room, but what I didn't see a Bible or a religious-related book on his nightstand. I've spent many times in prayer, just Elvis and I. There was two different degrees of relationship with Elvis. One degree was the men that uh, worked for him that were on salary every Monday morning. They got a paycheck. Then there were those of us that uh, didn't uh, get a paycheck every Monday morning. We more or less worked with him on his show. And I think he placed uh, us in that category uh, and placed them in that category, two different categories. But he told me that uh, but well, when he was a little boy, he had such poverty. In 1955, 56, he became a millionaire, not having enough money to uh, buy anything but a hamburger, and the next day being able to buy anything that he wanted. So he never knew the meaning of money. Money meant nothing to him. He bought a farm in Mississippi. Now, Graceland is in the southern part of Tennessee, even further than Memphis. And about 10 miles from there is uh, Mississippi. He bought a farm, and he spent over $100,000 in fixing up this house that was on the farm. And anything Elvis thought of or he wanted to do, money meant nothing to him. So uh, he decided if he was going to be a farmer, he ought to have a pickup. So when he got his house fixed up and had his farm, well, in his mind at that time, he was simply a farmer. He told his daddy, Vernon, he said, uh, now Vernon was the type of man that it's probably that it was good that he was that type of man, that he wanted to save money because Elvis give away money by the hundred thousands of dollars. It meant nothing to him because you got to realize that even if he gave it all away, he could go out within two weeks and make another million dollars. So it didn't mean anything to him. But Vernon was trying to save money. So when he got his farm, he said, uh, Daddy, I want to pick up. Well, Vernon, uh, knowing that Elvis Presley had no reason to have a pickup, he said, Son, you don't need a pickup. Well, it aggravated Elvis. So he went to uh, his manager, Joe Esposito, and he said, uh, go out and buy me a hundred pickups. The next morning when Vernon, which Joe did, the next morning when Vernon came out to the farm, there was a hundred pickups in the front yard. Elvis gave away every one of them. He would get out and have his limousine to follow him, and uh, he would see a farmer plowing or either driving a tractor in a field, working his crop, and Elvis would crawl over the fence and uh, I can imagine this farmer seeing uh, 
this guy dressed just a little bit different than uh, the ordinary person. And uh, Elvis would walk up, and this guy would probably think that he was a hippie. Elvis would say, how you do, sir? said, uh, I'm Elvis Presley. I can imagine this former would say, yeah, I'm Franklin D. Roosevelt, too. But Elvis would say, uh, sir, would you love to have that pickup? And of course, then he would get the farmer's attention. He said, yeah. He said, well, uh, this is my manager, Joe Esposito. Give him your name and address, and I'll send you the title to it tomorrow. He would leave that pickup beside the road, and he gave away all 100 pickups. I had it in my bedroom, and I still got it, a telephone that nobody in the world had the telephone number but Elvis. Whenever he would want uh, to talk with me, whenever he would want me to come to Memphis or to Palm Springs, to L.A. or to Colorado, wherever he might be, to Hawaii, then he would call. And of course, I was glad to go. And Elvis had many friends like this. He called me one night uh, from Fort Worth, and uh, he said, J.D., I want a bus. I was at home in Nashville. He was in Fort Worth. And I said, okay. He said, uh, have it in Memphis by the time I get home. I said, well, when will you get home? He said, in about an hour. I said, Elvis, there's no way that I could even drive my bus over to uh, Memphis from Nashville within an hour. He said, well, just find me a bus. I'll call you later. So I talked to Ed Enoch and Larry Strickland and got them to call in different places that we uh, uh, knew about buses, and they found one over in North Carolina. When he got back home, well, he called me again. He said, you got me a bus? I said, well, I found one in North Carolina. And uh, he didn't even uh, tell me what he wanted with it or anything else. What it really was, he had heard T.G. Shepard on the radio, and uh, he was just getting his start, and Elvis wanted to buy him a bus. I said, well, Elvis, he said, well, how are we going to buy it? I said, well, I won't buy anything and spend your money unless I go investigate it and be sure it's a good bus. He said, okay, how do you want to do it? I said, get me your plane over here in the morning, have it here at 9 o'clock, and send me a blank check and sign it which he did. We went to North Carolina, we bought the bus, and uh, Larry Strickland drove it to Memphis. When we got there, Elvis got in the front seat. We all did. And he had his limousine follow the bus. We took it over to T.G. Shepard house, which is in Memphis. He sent word for him to come out. T.G. come out and Elvis jumped off the bus and said, here's your bus. And T.G. couldn't even think of anything to say. He said, well, I, I don't understand. He said, well, you don't have to understand. There's your bus. Elvis just, by mere chance, heard him on the radio and liked his voice, investigated and knew that the young man was struggling to start a career. That was the kind of man that he was when he felt there was a need that he tried to supply it. Many people ask the question about he and uh, his wife. Did he love one another? Did they love one another? They certainly did. But the drive to be Elvis, the drive to entertain people, to sing to people, that's the price that an entertainer has to pay. It was too many people took up too many parts of his life. He spread his life to so many people that became very thin to his family. And there was a price that his wife had to pay. And it was just simply too big. And Elvis couldn't help this because he was destined of God to be Elvis Presley. Many people uh, ask the question, well, was he, was he a Christian? Was he saved? Was he... Uh, a religious man. He was so much more religious than anybody could even imagine. He was certainly not the Elvis that you saw on stage. 
Elvis had enough sense to know that uh, when he went on stage to leave politics and religion and his personal life off the stage. He went on the stage for one reason, and that was to give the person that paid $15 or $10 or whatever it might be to get in. He tried to entertain them. But his personal life was a very, very religious. I spent many hours with him reading the Bible, talking about uh, Jesus Christ. Now, certainly, Elvis uh, was not perfect, but he was a deeply religious man. If you have ever listened to him in person or on record, sing a gospel song, and there would be doubt as to his sincerity and his belief in God. And a lot of the stories that you've read about him being uh, wild or him uh, being like Howard Hughes, and I don't even know where Howard Hughes was the way that the books said that he was. But Elvis was not that type of man. Elvis uh, very seldom went along with anything other. Uh, some of the things that's been written about him was wild parties and uh, the fun that was had. Elvis never was in on any of this. Not that he didn't have fun, but all of the things that they said about the wild sex parties and uh, Elvis wasn't a part of them at all. We were playing Vegas and uh, one of the bodyguards came up to me, the man that was in charge of security, and he said, we got three calls today uh, from some nuts saying he was going to shoot Elvis on the first show. He said, keep your mouth shut, but uh, just watch the audience. If you see anybody move uh, a little different, will you let us know, and uh, you remember to try to protect Elvis. Well, it made me very nervous, and uh, I did watch the audience. After the first show, of course, we always had two shows. He came to me and he said, uh, well, we just got another call from this nut. And he said he will kill him on the second show. He said, bring the stamps up to the suite, which was called the Imperial Suite. And he said, bring them up there. I want to give them uh, a briefing on security. He said, don't tell them what it's about. Just tell them that Elvis wants to see him up in the suite. And of course, I got the boys and... Uh, we went up. Elvis was there, and they had about 20 security guards from the hotel, plus Elvis's bodyguards. And uh, they began to tell the Stamps Quartet what had happened about this nut calling to uh, kill Elvis during the show. And of course, everybody was very much interested. And about that time, uh, we could see the front door. Well, there was a big noise, and uh, the door burst open, and uh, they said, there he goes. And they began to fire shots. Well, of course, we were involved in it, and uh, we thought that somebody had broken in the suite and was trying to kill Elvis. Elvis hit the floor. All the stamps hit the floor, and uh, they fired a shot, and one of the bodyguards fell to the floor and started jerking. Well, when Elvis hit the floor, I don't know why I did it, but I went and uh, covered Elvis. I lay on top of him. I said, well, they want to kill me. So if I lay on top of him, uh, then they won't shoot him, which I was crazy because they would have. They would kill me. And I loved Elvis very much. He was my friend, but I necessarily didn't want to die at that time. So I covered Elvis anyway. Uh, through the excitement, I went and lay on top of him and tried to cover his complete body. Well, when I did, they were still shooting in the suite, and Elvis started laughing. So I lay there for a minute, and I could still feel him laughing. I said, okay, fellas, it's all a joke. And about that time, uh, one of the bodyguards stepped around the corner with a gun, and he fired it. Of course, it was a blank gun and it hit me in the face, on the cheek. There's a certain amount of pressure or something that comes out of a blank that uh, won't kill you, but it will sting you if it hits you. 
Well, it hit me in the face. And uh, all of a sudden, I said, well, it is real. So back down, I went. Then they all started laughing, and it was over with. That was about the only joke that Elvis really ever pulled on us. Of course, the bodyguards pulled many jokes on us, and we had a fun group, and the whole family, the TCB family of Elvis, were fantastic people, everybody. Even a book that has been written, I don't believe these men that were supposed to have written this book, I don't believe they wrote it. I knew them, I knew their personal lives, I knew how much they loved Elvis, how much Elvis loved them. I just simply don't believe they said what that book said until they themselves tell me that they wrote it. I simply won't believe it. Now, as far as some of the things about uh, him and that, and uh, some of the news that came out about him shooting out TV sets, was in his room one time in uh, Asheville and. Uh, we was watching a TV show and them lines went sideways and uh, that TV set started rolling and all of us technicians tried to adjust it and we couldn't get it adjusted just time we'd set back down well she'd start rolling again so he asked everybody to step aside and sent for his gun and he shot that baby And I, I was so proud for him, I couldn't hardly stand it. <laughs> I want to be able to shoot at least one before I die. <laughs> if I had to go out and buy me a black and white used one just so I can shoot it. Elvis Presley made over four billion dollars in his lifetime. I didn't mean four million, four billion dollars, giving away over half of it. To his friends, to charity, he gave away many things to charity that were never meant was because that was what he wanted. Mr. Sumner, my name's David Taylor and I'm from Ryanji, Mississippi, and uh, was there any drugs involved in, in the organization? There was a lot of drugs, uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of pills. Uh, the Stanley boys, uh, some of the some of my boys. I never uh, used any drugs, but there was a lot of drugs. Uh, Elvis Presley was on prescribed drugs. Elvis had glaucoma. Uh, he had. Uh, a colon problem. Uh, he had different problems that he was on prescribed drugs. But there was a lot of drugs that were gotten in Elvis's name that uh, Elvis knew nothing about. And when they would get to Las Vegas, even some of the Stamps Quartet would get into that black bag and uh, get a handful of uh, different kinds of pills. Uh, I, I never took but one pill to supposed to pick you up or keep you awake and it was a black widow, a black spider or something or another and I I took one of them and chewed my tongue for four days and that's the last one I ever took but there was a lot of drugs but there, wa there wasn't for Elvis Presley they were bought in his name there was prescriptions that was forged uh, Dr. Nick's name was forged uh, to get prescriptions filled at the drugstore, but they were not for Elvis Presley. Mr. Sumner, could you please describe for us the events of August the 16th, 1977, in the life and through the eyes of J.D. Sumner? Uh, my wife, Mary, had taken me to the airport and uh, had taken our grandson, Jason, and... Uh, Elvis had sent his Jetstar to pick up uh, 
the Nashville people, which included Felton Jarvis and the Stamps Quartet and myself. We were on his plane fixing to leave. And they come on the plane and told us that the tour had been canceled, that it was off. And I, I couldn't believe it. I tried to question it, and they, I said, why has it been canceled? Well, believe me, it's canceled. And they, if they knew, they didn't tell us. So the tour's been canceled, just go back home. So my wife had not left, and uh, waiting to see me off on the plane like uh, everybody does. So I got in the car with my wife and my grandson and started home, wondering myself as much as anybody why the tour had been canceled. I thought possibly that uh, maybe something had happened to Vernon uh, Presley, Elvis's dad, because he was a very sick man. On the way home, uh, we had the radio on, which I very seldom play the radio in the car, uh, but... That day we had it on. It was real dark. Uh, the clouds were real dark. Uh, looked like it was going to storm. And I guess we had the radio on uh, to see if there was a tornado or something in the area. And uh, they announced that the king of rock and roll, uh, Elvis Presley, was found dead at 2 o'clock today. And this was about or oh, four o'clock in the afternoon. And immediately nobody said anything. I didn't say anything, my wife said nothing, and even my grandson, being uh, two years old, didn't even say anything. And he didn't even know what was going on. But I didn't believe that Elvis was dead. I thought, well, this is either a, a thing that the colonel has pulled for publicity or either Vernon's dead and there's been some mistake. So I went on home when I got home in a dilemma, uh, not knowing what to do. My daughter came running up the hill. We lived uh, out in Bellevue, and uh, she come running up the hill to my house and said, Daddy, have you heard that uh, Elvis is dead? And I said, yeah, uh, I'm going to Memphis to find out what's wrong, because I didn't believe then that he was dead. So I got my bus driver, and Elvis had given me a limousine, a Lincoln limousine with a television bar and the whole works in it. Called my bus driver and got my son-in-law, and uh, we headed to Memphis. When I got to headed down toward Graceland and seen the crowd that was gathered on each side of the highway and even in the middle of the street. Then I realized that in all probability that it was so, that uh, Elvis was dead. I pulled on up uh, against what the police said I could do because they said nobody could go into Graceland. But I pulled up to the gates, uh, forced my way past the police, pulled up to the gates and uh, they saw who it was and they opened the gates and I pulled in. When I got into Grayson, uh, of course, like when anybody dies, there was people sitting around crying, talking. And when I got there, they said, Vernon wants to see you. Vernon was in a little uh, sweet deal that they had in Graceland for Elvis' aunt, his Aunt Delta, uh, she was more or less in charge of the housekeeping for Elvis. I went in there, and Vernon was in there, and his mother and, and uh, Delta was in there. And Vernon asked me, uh, I tried to console Vernon, like anybody would do, and then he asked me if I would be in charge of the funeral. He said, you knew uh, more about what he liked, what songs he liked, and who he would like to have preach the funeral, uh, his favorite preacher, this, that, and the other. He said, would you handle it for me? I said, yes, sir. So as soon as I could, I got out and, and went, 
checked into a motel and immediately started calling. The first thing I done was to call, uh, of course, my wife and tell her that it was so, that he was dead. And uh, then I called Rex Umbard. Then I called the different ones that I knew that Elvis would love to have seen, which was, uh, the, of course, the Stamps Quartet. I called uh, the Statesman Quartet and uh, got James Blackwood of the Blackwood Brothers. And that's the people that, that sang at Elvis' funeral, was the Stamps Quartet, Jake Hess, which was uh, Elvis' favorite uh, gospel singer. I suppose if you would pick out one man that uh, Elvis tried to copy or sing like it would have been Jake Hess. I picked out the people that uh, I knew that Elvis would want to sing in the songs. I had Kathy Westmoreland sing, My Heavenly Father Watches Over Me, and uh, picked out, well, we sung Sweet Spirit, uh, Known Only to Him, How Great Thou Art. The songs that Elvis had us to sing almost every time we got together, well, those are the songs that we sang at his funeral. Mr. Sumner, now, in lieu of all of the controversy, I I just got to come out and ask you like this: Is Elvis dead? Uh, I buried my mother last year, and if somebody were to come up and tell me they saw my mother, uh, and she was living, then I would hit them. I buried my best friend, that was Elvis. Uh, I was in charge of his funeral. Uh, I wish that he wasn't dead, but Elvis Presley died, and uh, he's buried in six tons of cement. He was first buried in the cemetery in a mausoleum, and they had threats of somebody going to steal his body, so Vernon got permission from the city to move his body uh, out to Graceland, and along with that, they were able to uh, uh, dig up Elvis's mother and bury her at Graceland. So Elvis Presley is buried at Graceland, and his mother is, of course, since then, well, his grandmother has died, and Vernon has died. So Elvis Presley is dead, and buried at Graceland. Mr. Sumner, could you tell us why Elvis's casket was so heavy? Was it because of a cooling unit that could possibly have been put in there for uh, preserving a waxed figure? Just why was the casket so heavy? Well, in the first place, uh, who said the casket was heavy? Uh, where did all this brilliant information come from. Uh, the casket was heavy. Uh, I sang at his mother's funeral. When my mother died, uh, she was buried in a mausoleum in a crypt. So I didn't buy a real expensive casket to put her in. Her casket cost $900. When Elvis's mother passed away. Uh, Elvis was a young man, and uh, he got the very best casket that he could find. He would have spent a million dollars if they would have had one that cost a million dollars. He would have spent that part. They found in Oklahoma City a casket that was solid copper. The more you pay for it, naturally the better the casket is. Elvis's casket was heavy because it was solid copper. The same casket that his mother was buried in, the same type of casket. When Elvis died, then uh, Vernon uh, wanted Elvis buried in the same kind of casket that his mother was buried in. So he got Joe Esposito to uh, call Oklahoma City and get the same casket 
uh, equivalent that his mother was buried in. So it was, it was a heavy casket. But as far as it being a wax dummy in the casket and an air conditioning, that is the most stupid. Uh, Elvis Presley was in the casket. Uh, I helped color in his hair where it needed touched up uh, because Elvis kept his hair dyed. Elvis was actually would have been gray headed had he not have done that, like me. But uh, Elvis, his hair would need to be touched up, and his hair was touched up. That was Elvis Presley in the casket. There was no air conditioning in the casket. There was no piece of wax. There was no reason for no air conditioning in the casket. Uh, that's just a bona fide implication. Uh, that is that it implies a lie. I wouldn't say that uh, something is a lie, but the implications was that if that if that has been implied that there's an air conditioning and a piece of wax in that casket, then it, it implies a lie. Mr. Sumner, what about the story about his hairdresser gluing his sideburns on? His hairdresser, uh, so as such, uh, he had no hairdresser. He had a guy that if he was there, uh, Sometimes he would let him do his hair. Charlie Hodge was Elvis's hairdresser. Uh, he'd done more of Elvis, fixing Elvis's hair than anybody else. There was an, not anybody that was a hairdresser for Elvis Presley. Charlie Hodge, if there had been anybody with that title, it should have been given to Charlie Hodge because he'd done his hair every night before he went on stage. And at any time he went any place where Charlie Hodge done his hair, but there was no hairdresser. There was a guy there, Gallagher, that uh, was supposed to, that sort of got out and said that he was Elvis's hairdresser, but he wasn't. Mr. Sumner, why was there no life insurance policy collected on Elvis's death? Well, people like Elvis Presley, John Wayne, uh, John Kennedy, uh, John Lennon, uh, people like that don't have insurance. Uh, people like myself, I have insurance policy. Uh, but what kind of a policy would have been on Elvis Presley? People like Elvis Presley own the insurance company. They don't uh, buy insurance. They uh, they own the company. When I was a young boy, my mother and daddy took out a $300 policy on all of us kids. And that policy cost a nickel a week. That policy was kept uh, for years on me until me and my wife just cashed it in and got what little we could get out of it. Elvis was much poorer than our family was, the Presleys were. So what kind of policy would they have had? Would it have been for 150 or $200? And would Elvis have paid the nickel a week or the three cents a week that it took? I doubt very seriously. Elvis Presley spent uh, $500,000 like uh, I would spend a hundred. So uh, I, I, don't see any need that Elvis Presley would have for a $10,000 policy, a $20,000 policy, a $100,000 policy, or a million-dollar policy. Lisa Marie, uh, in five years, will inherit what Elvis left, and she won't even need no ins insurance policy because it's supposed to be in the vicinity of $200 million, and I doubt that she'll need a policy whatsoever. Mr. Sumner, I named my son after Elvis using his, his middle name, Aaron. And I spelled it A-R-O-N, just like what I'd always seen on Elvis's birth certificate and all of his official records. But then, why then was his middle name, Aaron, spelled A-A-R-O-N on his gravestone? Because we had seen, uh, I mean, uh, certainly at the time of his uh, birth in Tupelo, Mississippi, they would have known 
how to spell his name. Well, of course, you got to imagine that Vernon Presley uh, didn't know uh, when he when he when this was spelt with two A's on the grave marker, the tombstone. Uh, I doubt that Vernon even noticed it. Vernon Presley uh, was an ignorant man. Now, don't misunderstand me when I say ignorant. Stupid is one thing and ignorant is another. An uh, ignorant man can learn. A stupid man can never learn nothing. But uh, I would not have known how to spell Aaron. And I doubt that uh, Vernon knew how to spell Aaron. In fact, I didn't even know Elvis's name was Aaron until he passed away. It was always Elvis to me. But uh, the guy that made the tombstone was not apparently a fan like you was. That you spelled it A-R-O-N. If you ask me how to spell Aaron, that's the way I spell Aaron. But the guy that made the tombstone, and I doubt very seriously that Vernon ever knew how it was spelled on the birth certificate or uh, even cared how it was spelled on the tombstone. Mr. Sumner, this lady said she took pictures of Elvis hiding in the back bathhouse. Well, uh, whoever said they made pictures of him uh, did not make pictures of Elvis Presley. Now, the photo that I seen uh, supposedly, as somebody implied that it was Elvis sitting behind this uh, screen door, looking out over the swimming pool and the meditation garden. Uh, anything can be done with trick photography. Uh, you can take a picture and put it with another picture and screen one of them back and make it sort of hazy. Uh, that, whoever said they took a picture of Elvis Presley uh, lied because Elvis Presley was dead and there's no way that he could have been sitting behind that chair unless Jesus has done it again. Uh, there's only been two people that's been raised from the dead. That was Lazarus and Jesus Christ, and uh, Elvis Presley's dead, so there, nobody took a picture of him. That picture is also a hoax. But Mr. Sumner, why was the picture that was taken of the body within the casket? That didn't look like the Elvis we knew. Well, of course, uh, that was supposed to have been made by one of the cousins. Uh, and the question has come up that it didn't look like Elvis, uh, that his nose was flat, and uh, that it, of course, Elvis didn't look like he did when he was alive. Uh, Elvis died. Uh, he was on his knees and his elbows and his face was in the rug. Elvis had a massive heart attack. He lay there for about two and a half or three hours before he was found in that position. And by that, that time, the body deteriorates, and certainly uh, when, uh, by the time they found Elvis, rigor mortis had already set in. So his face was already shaped as to where a funeral home could not do anything about the looks, and then Elvis had an autopsy, which will change the looks of a body. Uh, he had the type of autopsy, uh, post-autopsy, that uh, everything is removed from the body. So this deteriorates the looks of a body. Had it been me, I would have never opened the casket. But Vernon came from the old school, the same as I did when my mother passed away, they asked me, uh, did I want, said Mr. Sumner, it's customary now that we don't open the casket at the church during the funeral, but it's up to you. I said, the casket will be open. Uh, Vernon should have kept the casket closed, but instead of that, Vernon had the casket open for everybody to see 
there was 80,000 people that came through uh, to view the body after it was placed at Graceland. Now the thing to do, in the old days, you brought the body home and people set up with it. The same thing happened to Elvis because Vernon was from the old school. Now people don't do that. Elvis was brought home to Graceland. He was put in the foyer uh, of Graceland and people were allowed by the thousands to come by and view Elvis Presley. And uh, it could have been easily that the casket could have been closed, it could have been a closed funeral. Even I would not have been able to have attended the funeral if uh, it had been a hoax or anything pertaining to a hoax. But Elvis Presley was dead, his casket was open, Thousands of people saw him. All the people at the funeral that day saw him. I felt of his hand. I know that Elvis Presley is dead. Why is there no death certificate? Well, uh, I am sure there is a death certificate because he's dead. A death certificate is not something that you put up on the wall of an accomplishment. Uh, when this question came up to me about Elvis's death certificate, I asked my wife, I said, honey, where is mama's death certificate? I had never seen it. My wife said it's in the Bible. Uh, I have never seen my mother's death certificate. I don't want to see her death certificate. I doubt very seriously that Vernon ever looked at it because he did not need to look at a death certificate to know that he had lost a son. And I don't need to see a death certificate to know that Elvis is dead. Seeing him dead is enough for me. Well, I guess sadly all of us in this room and everybody who has listened to this tape surely know by now that with you being there and you being in charge of the funeral, it's true that the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, is dead. But as we close this series of tapes, uh, tell us something funny. Well, of course, uh, when you was around Elvis, well, everything was funny. Because uh, if he wanted to be funny, uh, you laughed whether it was funny or not. Uh, but we were, I was in Tucson, Arizona, singing at a little Baptist church. Got a telephone call uh, from Elvis. He traced me down through calling my wife at home and finding out where I was at. He traced me down and uh, wanted me and the Stamped Quartet to come to Denver to sing at a funeral. And, of course, we had dates every night, so he sent, he said, my uh, jet star is on the way to pick you up. There wasn't any question of whether I was going or not. The plane was already on the way. So at that time, I had a boy singing bass by the name of Larry Strickland. So I left Larry with the bus to drive it to the next date over in New Mexico. Uh... The Stamp Quartet got on the plane. We went to Denver. We sang at the funeral. After the funeral was over, uh, of course, uh, Elvis came to the funeral dressed as a policeman. He had a police uniform on. He and Linda and uh, came to the funeral, and Elvis was supposedly a policeman. After the funeral was over, Elvis said, I want you to stay with me. Well, when he wanted you to do something, you did it. I stayed with him. And the quartet was sent back to finish filling the dates that needed to be done on that tour. I waited in my room, as you always did, for uh, to see what Elvis, uh, what he wanted, or if he wanted anything, or whatever. I just waited in the room until I, I was almost starving to death, so I decided I was going down to the coffee shop and have supper. I went down and had supper eat as fast as I could, come back up, and as I was approaching my room, I heard a telephone ringing. I run, unlock the door, 
And uh, sure enough, it was my phone ringing, and it was Elvis. Elvis said, uh, let's go and eat. <laughs> I said, well, it just so happens uh, I have just uh, have come from the coffee shop, Elvis. I have just eaten. He said, I don't care what you've done. I said, let's go and eat. <laughs> I said, I had no idea I was that hungry. Yeah, but, still uh, hungry. <laughs> I am starving to death. Let's go. <laughs> we went to a restaurant, which I can't name the restaurant in Denver. Uh, of course, the limousine was ready when we got downstairs. And we went to a restaurant to eat. He also had on a police uniform. We went out and eat, and uh, while we were eating, of course, he took his cap off at the table, because that's the way he was raised. And uh, what he ordered, what I ordered was lobster and steak, because there was, wasn't that much lobster and steak to what I could get it down some way without it <laughs> looking bad. So, uh, but what Elvis ordered was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, <laughs> and it cost $18. And uh, while we were eating, a man came over to Elvis and said, pardon me, sir, but you can settle an argument between the wife and I. Said, uh, are you him? Now, who was him? He didn't say, are you Elvis? He said, are you him? Elvis said, no. And he said, well, you certainly look like him. Elvis said, well, I've been told that a lot of times. That was the only way that he was bothered during the meal. We got through and came on home after uh, this stay in Denver. Of course, during this stay, uh, Elvis was in a giving away Cadillac mood, is what I call it. He had given away Cadillacs to the police department, to different policemen in Denver. And uh, we were watching the news uh, in his suite, and the little guy on, that was uh, the anchor man for the news said, well, our friend Elvis is still at it. He has now given away a total of 12 Cadillacs. <laughs> and he said, uh, by the way, Elvis, uh, when you get mine, I want a black sedan Seville. And Elvis said, give me the phone. And I said, my God, what's the man going to do? So he called the Cadillac man and said, I want a, a black sedan Seville at the TV station uh, by the time this guy gets off the air. The Cadillac man got the, the Cadillac to the TV station. When he came off the air, they had the cameras and all ready. They took him on the outside and the Cadillac was there waiting for him, the one that he had asked for just a few minutes before. Well, what was Elvis Presley doing? He was producing his own television show from the hotel. And I was sitting there saying, my God, why in the name of God don't he give me that Cadillac? Because <laughs> I was driving a Pinto at the time. But that's the way that he enjoyed life. But we came on home Elvis, uh, apparently, when he was a young boy, well, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches was his favorite. So he woke up one uh, afternoon and uh, at Graceland, and he wanted a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at this restaurant. He called his pilot, Milo, and got the crew together, got on the Lisa Marie, uh, the big airplane flew to Denver. I know personally I seen the receipt for the fuel. It cost $8,000 to fly the Lisa Marie from Memphis to Denver. He got on the plane, flew to Denver, got him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and flew back to Graceland. <laughs> that peanut butter and jelly sandwich cost him $16,018. And I would have personally made him uh, an arm load and walked him over to Memphis from Nashville here for $100.
<laughs> the articles that's been written about Elvis was he lonely. Elvis Presley was not a lonely man. If he was, then I want to be lonely. To an extent, we all live a lonely life. Sometimes you can be with somebody and still be lonely. And there's a price to pay by being Elvis Presley. There's no use in anybody trying to kid themselves and saying that he was an ordinary human being. He had to pay a price for being Elvis. But he was willing to pay that price because he loved what he was doing. He loved it very much. There's a price to pay for anything in life that's worthwhile. And Elvis was glad to pay that price. But he certainly wasn't lonely. Elvis had uh, some very deep, close friends. So a man that had uh, all the money in the world, and uh, if he wanted to talk to J.D. Sumner, said, J.D., uh, I'm sending my plane after you. Uh, I want to talk to you. And I would go, or we'd talk on the telephone for two, three, or four hours. He certainly wasn't lonely. He lived the kind of life that he wanted to live. He'd done what he wanted to, when he wanted to, and how he wanted to, and where he wanted to. I don't know whether anybody was ever faced with this one decision or this one uh, situation other than myself. I needed a new bus. I had uh, an old bus and uh, it was broke down and stayed broke down and Elvis knew it. So we were playing uh, Shreveport. And he, between shows, many times we did a matinee and a night show. Between shows, uh, Elvis sent for me to come up to his room. And it was always Regardless of who it was, it was a thrill for Elvis to send for you because you wanted to do something for him because he done so much for those around him and for mankind. I had already ordered me a meal and they had just set it down in front of me and I just paid for it and walked out and went up to see Elvis. Of course, he always had a suite uh, and he was in the bedroom when I walked in. Well, Joe said, Elvis wants to see you. So I went in the bedroom. He was in his pajamas and a house coat. And he said, sit down. So I sat down. So he told Joe, he said, bring me a check. Bring me a blank check. Joe brought him a check in, and he said, uh, you need some money? He said, uh, fill it out for what you want. I said, Elvis, I can't do it. I simply cannot do it. He said, the heck you can't. You can write it out. Fill it out. And there I was, would have bluffed to have filled it out for a million dollars, and he would have signed it. Of course, I didn't. I filled it out for what I needed. He said, it's not too much. If you need any more, come back. Let me know what you need, and you got it. That's the kind of man he was. He was a man that... Uh, Money meant nothing to him, only his friends, only uh, mankind, a man that gave his life. And a man like that, a man that lived his life for the public, a man that filled his calling of God like Elvis Presley, simply cannot be bad. He wasn't perfect. Neither am I, and neither are you. But I just wished that I could be as good as Elvis Presley was. sent this world a baby boy who was born in poverty 
And as a boy, he wondered what would be his destiny. His life was to be busy and things happened that even he couldn't believe. He had so much to give and yet very little to receive. He started out with a song and a wiggle. Some people couldn't understand. But you and I now know it was all in God's plan. No sooner had he started when he lost his most precious prize. Tragedy struck this young man. His mother died. By this time, he had the colonel who was to guide his every step. And things begin to happen that neither one could seem to help. He came home from the army and we saw him on TV. And because of that wiggle, they wouldn't even show his knee. His career in the movies took him from us for a while. Even though he didn't like it, he still gave the world a smile. He came back to us in person. This is what he really enjoyed. And when he felt he didn't please us, with himself, he was annoyed. We demanded, not understanding, that he give to us his all. He tried to do what we wanted for the big and the small. The demand for his records to have a glimpse or touch his hand bit by bit it took its toll for even he was just a man God in all his wisdom even though we loved him so knew what was best it was time for him to go Precious Father, loving Mother. The king is gone, was what they said, August 16th, 1977.
just the tip. One thing you forgot when you wrote your book, the casket could have been closed and no one could have looked. I was there. I know. I felt of his hand and I know the difference between a hunk of wax and that of a man. Why, if he'd have wanted to pull a hoax like's been implied, he was smart enough to do it. But Elvis wouldn't live a lie. Well, this book too will gather its dust Plates that printed it will also rust. But one thing that nobody will ever end, and that's memories of a great man, a great humanitarian, and the world's greatest entertainer. Elvis. Yes.